I'd like to introduce um, everybody to Dr. our keynote speaker, Dr. Rita Sharon. I think that um, we are honored to have you here. Um, it is, um, I, I think if, if a lot of people, some people may know on this, um, on this, on this policy consortium about narrative medicine, but many of you do not. And so if you go back about 20 years, nobody's ever heard, of, nobody really heard about narrative medicine, but today the programs are becoming integral to medical school and residency trainings, as well as to many other pro programs focusing on healthcare. And the person who's most responsible for originating the field of narrative medicine is Dr. Rita Sharon. Dr. Sharon was a practicing internist, an internal medicine specialist at Columbia when she decided to get a PhD in English literature. And she brought her passion for medicine and her love of literature together. And she um, and founded the Masters in Narrative Medicine um, program at Columbia. And that program fuses on, on um, focuses on fusing humanities with clinical practice to teach healthcare providers how to give and receive stories, how to listen actively and to write reflectively. And I will say it also helps, we've been using um, some of the techniques of narrative medicine in our workshops with patients, healthcare providers, community members. So it, it is an ex, it's a really an extraordinary foundation for thinking, for listening, for actively listening, for knowing and for seeing, because I think a lot, all of us want to be known, all of us want to be seen. And as one of my friends and colleagues pointed out the other day, as patients, we also want to be believed. Um, and I think as healthcare providers, you also want to believe, be believed. And we've seen, we've seen a real rupture here. Um, so you, she writes extensively about narrative medicine. She conducts research uh, into the consequences of narrative medicine practices. And her talk today is entitled Narrative of the Embodied Self or How Health Happens Through Stories. And then following her presentation, we'll have, she'll have a brief discussion with Chris Wilson, our friend and colleague, Chris Wilson, who is our VP for Advocacy Communications and also a graduate of the Columbia Narrative Medicine Program. Um, we encourage a very active chat and, and discussion throughout today. And please put your questions in the chat. We're not gonna take live questions, but we take questions in the chat and we will answer as many questions as we possibly have. So thank you, Dr. Sharon. I'm going to turn it over to you. This is really a meeting of um, the minds and the hearts and the stories. Narrative medicine and patient advocacy are hand in hand. Uh, I thank Christine Wilson, who indeed is one of our graduates from the master's program. I see also that there are several other graduates of the master's program and current uh, um, practitioners of narrative medicine here on this, on, this, on this meeting. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about bodies. I want to talk about bodies and stories. In fact, the bodies is where the health happens, right? It's where the illness happens if it does, but it's where the health happens. And um, the persons come arm in arm with those bodies. And the bodies come arm in arm with the stories of those who live with those bodies. So there's no separating a body from its culture, its civilization, its tradition, its beliefs, its practices, its rituals, its families, all of that comes hand in hand into the healthcare effort. And I will talk about the failings of me and my colleagues within within the precincts of of medicine um, we don't always act as if the body is woven into the stories that that body can tell we know or we we are trying to teach all our colleagues that the stories are both delicate and indestructible that they're necessary that they're high stakes. And to, to echo what Gwen just said, they can only be told in the present tense of trust. I want from the outset to say one thing 
Just remember this, write it in red. Questions of patients' literacy in health have to include clinicians' literacy in life. And the failings have much more to do with the clinician's failure in their literacy than patients' uh, um, difficulties in, in theirs. Um, and, and just what I'm talking about is stories of illness are hard to tell. They're full of fear. They're full of worry. There's, you know, what do you mean? I'm infertile now? What do you mean? I'm going to be demented like my mother? I mean, this is what comes into a medical office. And yet we all know how scrubbed, scrubbed of affect, emotion, background, tradition, humor, poetry, how scrubbed are the things that, how can I say, qualify as histories of present illness. And they tend to be, you know this, you know this as well as I do, if a patient tries to say something in a clinical situation, in a clinical encounter, and, and, and goes slightly off script, they, they will be interrupted. When, when, when was the first stent placed? You know, how long have you been on Zoloft? Or the traditional, tell me about your pain. Is it sharp or dull? Like that's the only two things pain can be. So, you know, the, it is a decided risk and a downhill course if a patient really wants to represent her body, her health, and her life. Another way of saying all this is that we have to look very, very hard at what story itself is. And if the history of present illness is, is supposed to be one kind of story, and that which a patient has pressure to tell, desire to tell, uh, uh, um, we have to know how a story's built. How do they work? What happens between the teller and the listener? We know that it's not just words that stories are told in movement, in, 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 in body, in, in facial expression, all kinds of communication of affect, of illusion. So with that said, um, I decided I'd start my piece of this program with a, a video of a song of voices and movements. And I want for you to listen to what stories are being told, what, what old stories, what sounds of suffering we are hearing in this video. And I'll tell you afterwards what the video is. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait, wait in the Wait in the water, 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 wait in
come a long way, ain't turning back. No, 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 See the children, they're dressed up in blue. You know, my God's going to trouble the water. It looks like my people They're coming on, coming on through Well, my God's gonna, it's gonna trouble, trouble the water Well, everybody oh, yeah. just wait Wait on the water 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 Hello, The water. You know they're moving down to that Jordan stream. Well, God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, come on, my God, my children, 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 my I hope, wow, that is as much as I need to say in this keynote. You know, I hope that um, Wade in the Water is an old Southern spiritual. Harriet Tubman used this song to warn escaping slaves to be prepared to get into the water because the, um, the, the dogs, the dogs could not uh, track them through the water. So this was very much a song, an anthem of the escaping of slaves and the beginnings of what we hope will continue to be some, how can I say this, post-slavery America. Um, and the God troubling the water, I had to look this one up in scripture. It is that um, the, um, the angel of God would come and literally trouble the water at this fountain where ill persons were, were sitting. They were waiting for God to trouble the water. And as soon as the water was troubled, the first one into the pool would be cured. So I just want you to see 
how many ramifications of not just body and illness, but, but voice and harmony and community and the highest stakes possible. And please know that this is what we, this is what happens within our work in healthcare. Um, very, very quickly, um, narrative medicine came to be because of the fragmentation and the, the collusion of corporate um, um, goals, the impersonality, the expense, the simple fact that patients were not heard. And they lamented vociferously that their doctors don't listen to them, that nobody knows them. And, and early on in my own practice, I figured, well, that was my job, that they were paying me to listen to what they said. And all the conflicts and contradictions and how maybe the mother disagrees with the daughter, all of that. And I was supposed to figure out what it meant. And I didn't know how to do that. And that brought me to the English department. It eventually brought me to gather a host of scholars, clinicians, artists, um, patient advocates. We had, the, we had the head of the patient advocacy program at Sarah Lawrence. In, in, our, in our midst, um, and we wanted to figure out how to equip clinicians with strategies to hear what our patients tell us. How, what do they need? Doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, psychotherapists, physical therapists, what do they need to understand and honor the full measure of their situation? Uh, and to do it from their perspective. Um, as a bonus, it helped us understand our own experience of caring for them, but that was, that was secondary. So from the beginning, narrative medicine has had a commitment to teach clinicians how to listen from the patient's point of view. Um, our, 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 our programs, our training programs, require courses in illness, uh, uh, illness narratives, disability narratives, narrative medicine and justice, um, activism and advocacy projects. We're doing more and more work with community-based organizations, um, you know, um, HIV services for adolescents, um, activism in the trans community, uh, mental health services through pastors in Washington Heights. Um, and we team up with the service learning um, programs at the, at the health centers, the health sciences center, um, to get our our trainees to learn about things like food insecurity, cancer screening, uh, house calls to the frail elderly. These are things that they do in, uh, in uh, to get credit for their MD or their nursing license or their masters in in narrative medicine. Um, our clinicians are working directly with patients. I mean, some of it is very COVID related, the vaccination, the anti-vax work. Um, a, a group of us has established what we call abolition medicine, which is a very particular and, and uh, how can I say, disciplined effort to practice health care in the light of the history of slavery. Um, just two days ago, I read a, a thesis from a master's student on the use of narrative medicine in rights claims. And this was about the rights of deaf children, big D, small d, deaf children, to not be pushed into becoming a hearing person with cochlear implants and all the rest of it, but rather to have the opportunity to continue within the deaf culture. So these are, these are forms of what we have called radical listening and what we try to develop ourselves and, 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 and um, train others in. And it's a bi-directional radicality that both the patient, I'm not going to call one the teller and the other listener because they are bi-directionally listening and telling. They are bi-directionally developing what we call a container for what is heard. And, and one has to actively, as a listener, provide a container so that we can in some way catch 
that which is being said. And of course, that helps us understand how, how much of a contribution the teller makes to the story. So again, I repeat, this has to be done in the present tense of trust. Um, if we are able to do this kind of activist empowering listening, it becomes both a source of care and a source of shared power. So I think the challenges that we share, narrative medicine and patient advocacy, is to understand both dimensions of the language that I'm talking about, the complex life stories, and the hard to understand health stories. And again, I say we cannot talk about health literacy for patients without talking about life literacy for doctors. Um, all right, I want to show you some pictures, a couple of pictures, three pictures of bodies. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we get huh, embroiled in um, when I say that stories of health are hard to understand, I, under, I, I know, I, I acknowledge, I know that all our patients have not studied pathophysiology and they don't by necessity have to know about what causes illnesses or why you take a certain medicine. That that's not, that's not what we're trying to teach. Rather, we're trying to adopt means of being able to hear what it is that patients bring into the transaction. And I'm sure among us all, we will be able to come up with many, many ways of teaching back and asking questions and checking to make sure that, uh, 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 that both the patient and the clinician are understanding the same reality. Um, but, but, you know, to some, the word narrative medicine seems like an oxymoron. It's like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, uh, medicine is like objective things, like bodies and tissues and organs and scalpels. They're objective things. And narrative is immaterial. It's, it's words, it's metaphors, it's language, it's stories, it's imagination. And, and lots of our colleagues, our clinician colleagues, are, are reluctant to listen. They think small talk or chit chat is what they call it, is a waste of time. And it's very hard to convince them to listen as patients tell of, you know, things like feelings. So I, I wanna show you some, some bodies. Uh, now, um, I'm gonna keep my chat open even though I'm going into my shared screen. So feel free to just add bits into the chat, little words, little phrases, of, of what you see as we're looking at these, um, as we're looking at these um, images. Okay, do you see that? Somebody give me a, a thumbs up. Yes, I see Gwen nodding. All right, um, now please do write in the chat because I'll be reading it. And I want to see, I want to know, like, what do you, what do you see? What, what just as you look immediately, what, what does this, it's by Gustav Klimt, uh, 1905, but what are we, what is being portrayed? Tenderness, tenderness, motherhood, indeed. And how great, someone's last name here is Look, what a gorgeous last name. Vulnerability, sadness, exhaustion, love, motherhood, sadness, family, aging. Ooh, look at this one, a stacking of the cells. Do you see? Childbirth. And then Gwen says both despair and love. Okay, so don't we have a paradox here? Uh, I, I, I saw this painting, it, it's in the Modern Art Gallery in Rome. And I saw this, I was riveted. I couldn't leave this painting because it seemed just like Gwen said, to show both the despair of the old 
the old woman with the sagging breast and the protruding abdomen and the bowed head and the brilliance and beauty of, of the mother and child. And I had to remind myself here, someone says what is found and what is lost, but maybe they're both the same thing. This is why bodies can tell. Um, you know, either this young mother has only to look forward to becoming a crone like the old lady in the back, or the old lady in the back is the source of the fruitfulness and fertility that gave us the mother and the child. I think they're both true. Um, compassion, thank you, Tracy says compassion. Loss, circle of life, despair. Um, so you see how much we could do? Look, we had two minutes and we were already gathered as a community in looking at these bodies and what they may signify. Uh, here's another. Um, darker and different from the last. Um, this is by a contemporary Nigerian American artist called um, um, uh, Toyin Odutola. She's a printmaker and a painter. This is a print. And it's part of a series called Ruling Class from a big exhibit entitled Countervailing Theories. This is now, this is 2020. And the idea is this Nigerian American artist decided to supply her colleagues with the myths and the rituals and the stories that were lost in the Middle Passage. So no one knows the ancient stories of these um, tribes and these groups in Nigeria. And I'm told by, by uh, Africans that this landscape is identifiable. They know where in Nigeria this is. So this is really rooted in the land. And Odutola created a group of African women rulers. And this, this series of images shows the rulers. Uh, now, I'm not sure where we are. Ah, okay, Gustav Klimt. Oh, I see, there's lots more on the, on the Klimt. I, ho I hope that you're, you're looking at this one, deep strength. I think we're talking now. Deep strength, rooted strength, warrior, strength, knowledge, proud, proud, and protector. I mean, there's some kind of club in her hands, is there not? Connected to the earth and the stars, absolutely exploratory prowess. Do you see? So, so uh, Odutola gives us a fantasy world to replace the stolen words of the African debacle. Um, and again, thank you, Kathleen Frazier. I don't know if that's my Kathleen Frazier, but hello if it is. Um, I mean, my, my, my student and colleague. Um, the embodied part leads to the strength and the peace, towering confidence, bravery, and whispers of the past. Now, compared to the Klimt, this has way more authority and punch, and it holds, uh, well, we can talk about it in Q&A, it, uh, uh, um, it holds a challenge to us now, doesn't it, about what does it mean to be or have a ruling class. And finally, this is um, two guys playing cards in a cafe, not talking. Um, it's um, card players, Cezanne, late 1800s, 1895, I think. And I bring it here because um, they seem to belong in their bodies. Um, and Cezanne did a lot, of, a lot of paintings like this, and he would elicit, he would, he would solicit the, the workers on his father's farm in southern France to be the models, because he very particularly wanted to show, show the strength of the earth 
and how the strength of the earth was carried by the very workers of the earth. So these two men are not talking, um, but it's almost as if they're communing through their posture, through their movements, through their gestures, maybe even through the cards themselves. So yes, comfort in the silence, both fatigue and relaxation, contentment, I love it. Contentment, they don't have to say anything. So, so let's just keep these, these images in mind as we continue to talk about how our patients and we live embodied lives. That it's our bodies that locate us in time and space they grant us mortality for sure and because we're all good phenomenologists we we remember that the material body the material body my body my brain my nervous system my ears my sensory equipment is what enables perception and emotion and pain and pleasure and relation um, intuition consciousness subjectivity, creativity, these are all the things that, that we typically leave within the narrative dimension, but indeed we arrive at them through the material of our bodies, which is to say it is our bodies that connect us to the world and to one another. Our erotic lives come from our bodies. Um, our lives of protection, our lives of comfort, our lives of nurturance, all of it. Okay, now I, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep the Cezanne up there. I want to just tell you a few examples of how narrative medicine does this, and I'm mindful of the time. I think my time is up, so just a few examples of ways in which narrative medicine helps patient advocacy. Uh, we've been able to teach third year medical students to, you know what, I think I can bring this down now because I'm not going to show the rest of them. Um, we've been able to teach um, medical students when they're, when they're interviewing pregnant women at the beginning of their pregnancy, we have taught them how to inquire about what they want to do, neutrally, to elicit opinion from the woman of going to full term, abortion, adoption, and it's something teachable literally in an hour uh, and something critical, of course, to prenatal care. We have seen that collaborative trust increases between patients and clinicians um, after just a few sessions of reading and writing together. That These were HIV patients in um, LA with a group of medical trainees. And we simply put them together and asked them to write about important things in their lives. And through that process, they became, there was great reciprocity and collaboration and trust was built on both sides. And I could go on. I mean, we can see how the healthcare team becomes more permeable to one another's um, perspectives. Uh, we've worked in oncology with patients and clinicians together. Uh, we've even increased the uh, power of weight bias training by bringing in persons with obesity, not just as exhibits, but on the faculty. So, and we could go on and, and let's now go to Q&A so that others trained in narrative medicine can, in, can uh, add to what I've been able to say right now. But Christine, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Rita. Um, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate what you've done here in such a short amount of time. I think anyone can see from your three pictures how evocative and what can come forth with even just sort of sticking your toe into thinking about what an embodied uh, and, and what it means to translate that. So when I started at, um, at, at the narrative medicine program, I had, I was rather advanced in age and I, really had had no thought of going back to school. But when I heard about what it was, this combination of medicine and literature and writing and close reading, I thought really that's what I've been waiting for all my life. But I wasn't quite sure where it would go. 
So you alluded to it a little bit, but just expand a little bit on on kind of the cohort of, of, of narrative medicine graduates and that you have developed over time and, and, and some of yes. where they come from and what they're doing. Yes, good. So, so we've known over time, it, it, it varies from year to year, but about a third of the, pay, of the students coming in to a master's class, and this is true, we have two. We have a master of science class and we have a certificate or a certification of professional achievement in narrative medicine that's a shorter, less kind of scholarly academic um, uh, training program that can be finished in a year. So in both cases, uh, but these figures are from the masters, uh, about a third of the incoming students are recently out of college pre-health. So they're college graduates who are on their way to nursing school, social work school, psychoanalytic training, medicine, or public health. Uh, about a third, although this changes, this group has been smaller in the recent past, are mid-career professionals. And they're nurses, social workers, doctors, physical therapists. We had a veterinarian once um, who come into the program to be able to transform their practice. So, for example, our current students includes the director of the child abuse program at Columbia um, and the associate director of the neonatal intensive care unit. So, and then, and then the, the, the rest are an assortment of writers, artists, musicians, scholars, literary scholars, uh, scholars in philosophy, history, um, who come in not to become clinicians, but rather to equip themselves to use their skills to improve healthcare. And, you know, we, 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 are, we are now tracking our students, many of them finish, and then they go into medical school or nursing school, where they are very successful, even as first year students in developing programs, in training other, other, um, uh, other students. Um, but but that's that's kind of the overall gist. And Christine, um, we keep developing new jobs for our graduates. That is that is my undying responsibility. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's really important to let people know that there really are very practical and applied ways that this this knowledge can be used in in a wide range of mm. healthcare settings and, and all kinds of settings. Um, so you alluded to this a little in your talk, but I would love to hear a little more about where that germ, that seed that you had, that's, that when you, when you had the realization that, you, that the humanities and, and this business of bringing literature and philosophy and reflective writing could really make a difference in how people practice medicine and hear, their, hear stories and, and, and care for their patients. So I'd like to know a little more about how that happened. So where it came from is very, very literally, as soon as I was finished with training, I finally had a job. I was working in the Presbyterian Hospital Medicine Clinic, and I had, for the first time in my life, my own patients, instead of just every now and then, you know, doing a month of clinic. And, and it, it didn't take long for me to understand what my task was. Um, now, at that point, I, I love to read. I read a lot, but I didn't know how. I wasn't an English major. I didn't exactly know how. And it struck me that what I was being asked to do was be a curator of stories and to know what it was. You know, one patient, uh, a patient with terrible diabetes who had had multiple uh, uh, doctors sent around from one to the other. She felt abandoned by them all. And on our first visit, I taught myself not to say very much in a first visit, just to put my hands in my lap and listen. And when she finally got all of her rage out about how mistreated she had been for all of these doctors over the years with her diabetes, she says, you want to know what I really need? She says, I need a new set of teeth. And that was all I needed. And I could happily not fuss with the insulin for a few months 
and go march up to the dental clinic and get her an appointment and make sure Medicaid would pay for another set of dentures. And we got her her teeth and she made the first, I mean, the first sustained major improvement in her insulin, uh, in her, in her sugar control. So that kind of, that, those are the kinds of lessons. If you listen to what a patient needs and you do your best to fulfill it, good things happen. Um, well, so that whole notion of listening, I, I not, I don't want to overgeneralize, but it seems that a lot of some sort of medical training and medical practice in the past was based on doctors having answers. Ah, it's almost like a, like a bad thing for a doctor to say, I don't know, or to ask a question without knowing the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so how has this narrative medicine training and, and practice really helps people to understand not just the importance of listening, but also to develop the skills that are needed to listen well? Well, that's it, and they're deep skills. It's not like communication skills, one, two, three, which, which teaches people to say, oh, I'm sorry that happened to you. When did that last stent get put in? I mean, it's not that. It's rather to comprehend the deep, profound, uh, high stakes of hearing what another person says from their point of view and to not overlay your own. So it's almost a kind of reformulation of the self, Chris. I mean, it's deep. And that's why we teach them phenomenology and we make them read Emmanuel Levinas and we go into the complicated theory of narratology, of what makes a story and what makes a responsible reader and even what happens to the reader by virtue of reading. So this is like galaxies away from what's called communication skill. Oh, we got a standardized patient. We'll let you practice giving bad news. No, no. We, we make sure that the students understand the existential burden that is going on in, in that practice and what they are responsible for in not lightening the burden, but comprehending and acknowledging the burden. So it's deep. Well, you know this, Chris, because you went through it. It's, it's not surface. It's not surface knowledge. It's complex elemental knowledge. It was far deeper in many ways than I could ever have expected or been able to anticipate before I started it. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I was sort of debating my, my final question here, but I'll, I'll sort of go with that. Um, when we do reflective writing, like reading the text, the close reading and reflective writing exercises, or with not with professionals necessarily, but with community groups or, or patients or individuals, we get remarkable results. Yeah. It seems that, that that reading of a text and then that reflective writing taps into something that people aren't even really aware of before yeah. they put that pencil down. Mm -hmm. So can you just say a little word about the reflective writing and how you think it works? Well, we know. Uh, we know that writing is discovery. We know that in order to perceive anything, you have to represent it. A philosopher of art, Nelson Goodman, says when we perceive an object, we see a version or construal of it. It just depends on where you're sitting, what the, what the vase looks like or, the, or the, the, the plant. He says, when you represent that version or construal, you are not copying it, you are achieving it. So it's in the writing that we achieve a knowledge of what we have seen or experienced or been through. It's not, it's not a secret. All the writers know this. They know this. I write in order to know what I think. They know this. And it's the people who don't consider themselves writers who never found out. So I feel like I'm giving away like the most valuable uh, object by letting people who don't consider themselves writers to know that writing is an act of discovery. Now, they need a reader. They can't just do it all by themselves in their diary. That doesn't help. And that's why these, these, these groups, Chris, work. Because you have writing, but then you have listeners to what was written or readers to what was written. And that's where the magic comes because people say, you know, I'll say, wow, I love how you went from the first person in the first paragraph to the third person in the second paragraph. How did you know how to do that? And in, inevitably they say, I did that? So it's, it's, it's 
<laughs> but I think people are often afraid to write. They're afraid they'll be criticized or that they'll be thought to be not good. But I, I think this is a kind of a liberating form of writing as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we do our best to say, no, 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 no prelude, no prefacing. Don't tell me what a terrible writer you are. Just just read me what you wrote. And it, it, it takes 20 minutes for people to get used to the idea that they're not being laughed at. And of right. course, it takes a whole lot of skill to facilitate these things. I see Olga and, and Derek yep. and others on the screen. They know how to facilitate respectfully without without opening anyone to ridicule. Rita, thank you so much. Um, I hope that those of you who are listening to this will check into the uh, Columbia program. Um, it's a very special model. Um, there are lots of narrative medicine programs and many of them are very good and they're very useful. But the Columbia model is really very special in, in the way that it brings together these disciplines and these ways of thinking about things and puts people from so many different backgrounds in the same room together to share their stories and to, to give and receive. And I thank you so much, Rita, for giving us your time and, and your, your wisdom today. Uh, we, it was my again. pleasure and we have a lot of work to do together. Yes, well, we do. We, we like to work with people. So we, we, <laughs> that, that can definitely happen. Okay. <laughs> thank you.